we're talking about the Carnot and the ideal Rankine vapor power cycle. Uh, who was Rankine? There's his full name. These are the years that he lived, 1820, 1872. Can you tell me a little bit about that time period? Industrial revolution is really taking off. So you're having a lot of uh, replacement of human power and animal power by machine power. And a lot of that machine power is steam driven, steam driven, okay, steam engines. He lived uh, 52 years. He did not make it to 53. That's always humbling because I'm over that age. He, he accomplished much more than most people in their 52 or whatever years that you live. He did a lot from Scotland. He had a very wide range of technical interest. In 1843, uh, published a paper on fatigue and metals, especially dealing with railroad axles. 1855, Queen Victoria uh, appointed him chair of the civil engineering mechanics at the University of Glasgow. And then just four years later, a manual on steam engines and other prime movers. There's the key why we recognize him in thermodynamics and talk about him in every thermodynamics book around. So he has uh, honored with the temperature scale known as the Rankine. You add 460 to degrees F and that's what you get. The Rankine vapor power cycle, which we study, annual lecture series in geomechanics. He did a lot. It's not just a only in thermodynamics. Did a lot in materials and fatigue of metals, etc. Et you can always go out to the internet and you can read more about people and their accomplishments. So this is where I get a lot of information as well as other textbooks. So in review, we had the Carnot with the boiler and the high pressure in the boiler, the low pressure in the condenser, and you had the force States, state one, two, three, four. So one to two is through the turbine, two to three through the condenser, it's partial condenser. Three to four, you go through the pump and four to one. So it's, the cycle looks like a box on a temperature entropy diagram. And here it is on a, for the ideal Rankine cycle. Notice the big thing is that T4, the temperature at state four, is greater than temperature at three, but it's a whole lot less than what it used to be for the Carnot, a whole lot less. And that temperature difference is almost always grossly, and I mean grossly exaggerated. I've grossly exaggerated it here, okay? If you take a look at a real temperature entropy diagram for steam, here's one plotted, calling routine, evaluate thermodynamic properties. So we see the entropy scale, Going out, zero, there are the units, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, out to 10. There's a temperature scale, zero to 700. That's very hot, they're very cold. So it covers a large range of entropy and temperature. We have the red dome, that's the two-phase region. We have lines of constant pressure. Here's 10 kilopascal. Here's 100 kilopascal. It's heavy, thick line. Drew it so that it would emphasize atmospheric pressure. Below that, you're at... Uh, vacuum and above that out here you have 50 70 100 megapascal that's huge pressure what's the highest pressure our tables go to well what's the critical point pressure where that line would come down and just top off right there around 22 megapascal and I think the highest uh, pressure in our steam table in this book is probably 30 some, 40 some megapascals. So 100 kilopascals out there. Now you can go higher pressure, but we just don't see a lot of applications. So out here, there's no curve. What does that mean? You don't typically see steam with that low of an entropy at that high of a temperature. This is no man's land. Doesn't exist, right? And typically out here, this is also getting no man's land where you're at such low pressure that you would be hard pressed to find an application, okay? We have, have steam out there. So here's where the bulk of the data reside. Now, where it resides, is you can have it in a two-phase region, so it can be in equilibrium liquid vapor, that's under the dome. What would be all of this region out here? What would you describe there? How would I describe that series of states anywhere in that region? Super 
super critical, super critical fluid. How about out in this region? There's not a clean demarcation between supercritical and this other region, but what about out in here? What's this region called? Superheated vapor. So we have two phase, supercritical, superheated, and where is subcooled or compressed liquid? A very little sliver band, isn't it? It's a very narrow band. It's all kind of right in here. That's it. So if I'm in the subcooled or compressed liquid state, um, I'm in that band of states right there. It's not a, not a wide range of, of points. And if you want, we can zoom in on the plot because if you notice, it has a, uh, how do I say this? It has a bunch of different lines in here. They're, they're plotted, as well as I can get MATLAB to plot it and display it in a PDF file. And so those lines will come up until they hit the saturated liquid line, and then they'll come straight across. See that? There's a lot in there. And so, yes, the temperature in the pump, it'll make it go up, but it may go up a half a degree, a quarter of a degree, one degree C, but we'll always typically exaggerate that on a TS diagram so we can see the difference between the location of the point, the point three and point four. All right. Why is the thermal efficiency of the ideal Rankine cycle less than the Carnot cycle? Why? Why is it less? Why is the thermal efficiency, eta, less for the ideal Rankine cycle than the Carnot cycle. Here's a student who might have written this answer. They say, oh, the ideal Rankine cycle isn't less efficient than the Carnot. The flow through each component, through the boiler, through the turbine, through the condenser, through the pump, and each so in, in, in the, each of the cycles in the ideal Rankine as well as the Carnot are internally reversible. Is that statement true? Yeah, that statement's true. There is, hence, there is no friction in the ideal Rankine cycle. Is that statement true? Is it true? Yeah. Hence, both cycles are maximally efficient. They have no friction, no irreversibilities. They're maximally efficient. Does that sound reasonable? Hence, they have the same efficiency. Do you agree? Is this good or not good? Some other student may write this. They say, uh, it is because the Rankin operates at lower pressures than the Carnot. The Carnot can have a higher boiler pressure than the Rankin. Do you agree with that? Is that the reason why the Rankin has a lower thermal efficiency than the Carnot? Or how about this statement? The Carnot thermal efficiencies only depend on temperatures. For example, the efficiency is equal to 1 minus Tc over Th. Do you agree with that? Is it 1 minus Tc over Th? Yeah? Is, that's the Carnot thermal efficiency, isn't it? And hence, it only depends on temperatures. Is that true? Is that whole statement this far good? While the Rankine depends on the enthalpies, which determine quantities like the work net, the boiler heat transfer, and the condenser heat transfer. Is that the reason? See, uh, I like to ask questions where students would actually have to write out uh, like a paragraph. I think most engineering exams should have some component like that to assess your knowledge where either you have to speak and, and give an explanation or write out an explanation. But you know what? I've tried to grade those. And you get answers like this. It's a lot of right, but a little bit of wrong. It's really hard to grade. It is so hard to grade. And it becomes a nightmare to grade. So th that's why they don't do it. But you know, if you ever go and get a doctorate, guess what type of exam they give you, at least for part of the exam? An oral exam. That's really the best exam, 
oral exam. Stand up, explain yourself. Explain this, answer this question. Just tell me, you know, oh, no equation sheet, no calculator, just explain. Anyway, um, so there's an error in each of these statements, right? The bottom line is, is the thermal efficiency, the ideal ranking, less than the Carnot, yes or no? Yes, it is. Now, why? Why? Why is it less? So we take a look here, and we explain this difference by considering an entropy balance on a generic heat engine. Entropy transfer can explain this. Okay, so consider a heat engine operating in a cycle, and its goal is to produce as much work or convert as much of the heat transfer coming in from a high temperature source into work as possible. Because isn't the thermal efficiency the work out divided by the heat in? Is that the definition of thermal efficiency for a heat engine? But we know that we have to throw some heat away. Why? Why do we have to throw any energy away to the environment, to a low temperature uh, uh, sink? So, well, it's because you can understand that limitation of the second law through entropy and entropy balances. So if I have energy, heat being transferred in, and it's coming in at TBH, what's that? The boundary temperature of the heat engine that the hot, high temperature, you know, heat transfer is occurring at. That's TBH. And there we're going to have TBC. That's the cold boundary temperature of the heat engine at which its QC is coming out. So what is the entropy transfer with the Q of H coming in? What's our equation for the entropy transfer with Q sub H coming into the heat engine? Do you remember? I'm going to pause and I want you to write that down. All right, so what is the amount of entropy transferred in with QH coming into the system? It depends on QH and it depends on TBH. Is that it? What is the entropy transfer with the work going out? Zero, no entropy transfer with the work. And so what is the entropy transfer with the heat going out of the, to, to, to the cold sink? True? I'm going to increase the complexity of this problem by saying you could have a sigma inside the heat engine. What's sigma? You could have some entropy generation due to irreversibilities occurring in this heat engine. Now, if you're talking Carnot, what's sigma? If you're talking ideal ranking, what's sigma? Zero. But we know that if you do have irreversible, it's going to degrade the performance. But for, for now, sigma is zero. But I'll leave it in there, and then you just say, yeah, for right now, for Carnot and the ideal ranking, it's zero. Okay. So uh, if I do an energy balance, for this system, what do we get? We get that QH in either goes to work out or QC out. True or false? Is that energy balance? Can we do an entropy balance for this heat engine? Entropy in, S, QH coming in, plus if I had any irreversibilities, but I'll put it in there knowing that for the first part of this discussion, sigma zero has to go out with QC or out with work. But there's no out with work. It's just out with QC. What comes in, transferred in, plus what's generated inside the system due to irreversibilities has to go out. That's an entropy balance. True or false? Do you like that? So we can say from the entropy balance, SQC is equal to SQH plus sigma. We can then say, SQC is QC divided by TBC. True? So we find that QC, the how much you have to throw away, is TB 
times how much you brought in and how much was generated. True or false? Then we use this back to the first law. And then we find that, let me just kind of jump down here, that the W is Q sub H minus QC. It's Q sub H minus TB SQH plus sigma. It gets a little abstract, but what we do is um, say to yourself, if I would like a large amount of work to be produced, that will give me a great or a large thermal efficiency, right? So I like to maximize W, right? Then what I'd like to do is not maximize QC, but minimize QC. Make QC small. How do I make QC small? Well, if I have any irreversibilities, I need to reduce them or eliminate them. That'll help make QC small. And also, I'd like to bring in as little as possible. Make this small. Make the amount of entropy being brought into the system with the high, uh, high uh, Q sub H, make that uh, small as possible. True? How do you make the amount of entropy being drawn in with Q sub H small. Increase TBH. Make, make a high, high, high temperature for TBH. Likewise, if I want to minimize QC, I can make this minimum, and I can also, what do I, should I do for TBC? I left out that subscript. What should I do with TBC? Make it big or small? Make it, make it small, okay? So let me do this. I'll click over to this slide, which summarizes just what I wrote. So if I have QH in, let's throw some numbers down. Let's say I bring in 1,000 kilojoules. And because we want to make math simple, let's say we bring it in at 1,000 Kelvin. That's hot. But it makes the ratio of Q over TH easy. So the amount of entropy brought in is one kilojoule per Kelvin. That's uh, the right units for entropy, and that's what's brought in with that QH. Now we look down here. Let's say it's 300 Kelvin because that's a typical atmospheric temperature. It's close enough. If we have any irreversibilities, then there's more entropy that has to be transferred out. Otherwise, it's simply this amount. Let's put this equal to zero. And so Q, SQH is one kilojoule per Kelvin. That's how much has to go out with the cold heat transfer. So if I have a 300 degree Kelvin temperature, what does QC have to be? 300 times one. So it's 300 kilojoules goes out then what is the work? If I brought in 1,000, I had to throw out 300 to do an entropy balance. What is the work? 700 kilojoules, true? So the minimum heat transfer out, 300 kilojoules, and we find the thermal efficiency to be 70%, which we already, this is the maximum, 70%. What happens if I just go back and I do the 1 minus TC over TH? Does that give me the same efficiency? Sure. It's 1 minus 300 over 1,000. That's 70% thermal efficiency. All of this is to help build up to explain why the thermal efficiency for the ideal ranking is less than the Carnot. So let's do this. Here are the numbers for the 1,000 and 300, just like we discussed. But let's change the boundary temperature to not be uh, 1,000 Kelvin, but 500 Kelvin. If you reduce TH, what happens? You bring in more entropy. You just doubled the amount of entropy you brought in. If you brought in that entropy, even if you have sigma equal to zero, you still have to transfer more entropy out. Make sense? 
So just run the numbers, leave this 300. You find that QC, you have to take out now 600 kilojoules, which means you only leave 400 kilojoules for the work, which means the thermal efficiency is now 40%. I hope that all made sense. So play this game. You make that comparison. If I just reduce TBH from 1,000 to 500, it makes things worse for thermal efficiency. True? Now, what says, what prevents you from having a heat engine that has so much heat coming in at 1,000 Kelvin and so much heat coming in at 500 Kelvin? You can still do an entropy balance with two Qs in. True or false? Can you do that? So let's bring in 900 and 100. So we're still bringing in 1,000. We want to compare 1,000 in, 1,000 in, 1,000 in, OK? Instead of bringing it all in at 500 or all in at 1,000, we'll bring in 900 at 1,000 Kelvin and 100 at 500 Kelvin. This brings in so much entropy. This brings in so much entropy. I have to reject then the sum. And when you reject then the sum, I think you get uh, 360. Is that correct? Or did I make an error? What's well, 1.1 1 .1 times 330? Uh, 300. Isn't that 330? I'm sorry, this should be 330 kilojoules. See this 0 0.9 plus 0 0.2 is 1.1. 1 .1. You multiply that by 300, that should be 330, meaning you have 670 kilojoules of work, meaning it's 67% efficiency. So you're between the 70% and the 40%. Make sense? This explains why the uh, thermal efficiency of the ideal Rankine cycle is worse or less than the Carnot. Because when we take a look at what about all the heat that's come into the system? It's not only the part to take it from saturated liquid to saturated vapor, that's the same amount of heat, but you're bringing in a lot of heat to warm up the water that comes into the boiler when it's subcooled liquid. And that's coming in at a much lower temperature. And so that degrades the performance. So how do, if you do have irreversibilities in the turbine and the pump, how does that change the thermal efficiency of the Rankine cycle? Let that now be not zero, be a positive amount. That just means you have to have a greater entropy transfer out because you have more to get rid of, to dump, and you're going to have a higher Q sub C. When you have a higher Q sub C, you have a lower W, less work out, and efficiency is not maximized, it's reduced. So that's the effect of irreversibilities in the turbine and in the pump. What's the effect of boiler and condenser pressure on efficiency? So if I increase the boiler pressure, PB, or I decrease, typically increase the boiler pressure, decrease the condenser pressure, doesn't that help performance? And it does. The Boy, this line right here is the line for the condenser. And so if I decrease it, it'll drop down to a lower line, and I'll be changing TC. I'll be reducing TC. This is a line of the boiler pressure, and if I increase the boiler pressure, it'll be increasing TH. You can see that on a Carnot, but it's also true on the Rankine cycle. So what they like to do for steam engines is have a high boiler pressure and often you're stuck with the condenser pressure dictated by the cooling water that you're rejecting heat to. So how do you boost the boiler pressure? Easy, but it's dangerous. So um, here's some plots showing you the effect of the thermal efficiency as a function of the boiler temperature. I'm going to come back to this, but you can see that if you increase the pressure from 8 to 10, here's 6 megapascal, you're increasing the, the pressure in the boiler. 
it improves the efficiency. But what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about ASME. If you take a look at the ASME website, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, you could read about the history of it. It was founded 1880, and a lot of it is dealing with problems associated with industrialization and mechanization of society. What do you think this is an image of right here? Steam engine. There's a boiler over here, okay? And so early on, it, steam was the mode of power. They had a lot of uh, problems associated with some explosions of the boilers. So yeah, high boiler pressure, great for steam engine, efficiency, power output, but dangerous. And there's two notable ones. One happened in a shoe factory in Brockton, Mass. in 1905. Okay, that was not that long ago, but it was uh, after they had it. it. And they had been already working on codes and rules of, of uh, good practice. So, so boiler pressure vessel codes is basically one of the biggest accomplishments uh, that the ASME came out with. They have a lot of other codes as well. But what they did was standardize best practices. And then what happens is municipalities and states adopt those generated by an a, a ASME or other sources that generate these codes, and then that becomes the law of the land. Right? And one of the things you should learn as an engineer is there's always good standard accepted practices out there. What gets engineers sued is when they deviate and attorneys can prove that they didn't live up to the accepted practice and the norm in there. So one other event happened long before ASME was formed, and it's the greatest maritime disaster in U.S. history, and it happened in 1865, April 27th. What happened in April of 1865? Civil War, Appomattox, they surrendered and all that. And as it was winding down, a lot of um, Union uh, soldiers were uh, released from Confederate uh, prisoner of war camps. <clears throat> Andersonville in particular, and they weren't in very good health conditions and everything else, and they were anxious to get home. Anxious, the South was anxious to get rid of them too, right? So they would get to a city along the Mississippi and get on a steamboat, and the steamboat people were paid money to haul them up, and they made a lot of money. It was big money. So you can read about this uh, Sultana disaster, and uh, it's, the, again, the largest loss of life in the U.S. history. On this. It, it surpasses the Titanic. And you can talk about the causes of the steam engine boiler explosion. But they didn't follow accepted good practice, and it wasn't that high a pressure. Look at this. When it's supposed to release the pressure at 150 PSI, that doesn't sound all that high, does it? But um, these things make pretty good explosions. And once it explodes, you got coal, you got fire, you got burning ship on water, 2 a.m., and a lot of people died. Uh, there's no real hard number on the number of people that died, but it's uh, over 1,500. I think it's 1,700 to 1,800 people. That's a lot of lives. In this room, maybe 50. Take 50, all dead. Double it, all dead. Double that again and double, you know what I mean? It's a lot of loss of life. So whenever, uh, as an engineer, you always have safety in mind. But, but uh, for, for steam, get the pressure up. But when you get the pressure up, it's dangerous. There's also, uh, you can take a look at different, here's a surveillance video of a steam boiler that exploded. Um, here's a worker. He's about ready to get fired, fried by the steam explosion, unless he gets out of there. Yoo-hoo, leave now. That boiler right back there, I know it's not a great video, but yeah, get your lunch, get your bag, get, get, oh, please, don't, yeah, you looked at the clock, good, he's late for the train. It's 1.50 p.m., maybe he's taking a late lunch. So the video surveillance caught this explosion of a boiler. So this was in 07, uh, I can't remember. They sh they tell you the date, or they already showed the date. There's the plant and the pop. All right. So typically what happens, you run low on water, and then the vapor, and you keep pumping heat into it, and the vapor then just 
builds and builds. It's a pressure vessel. Pops, okay? So um, with that, I close out the lecture. You have one minute to make more friends in this class. Right? Make friends. Then talk to them. All right? <laughs>